Hello, hello. Let's do a mic check. Sound check. You know what? I plugged this into the wrong thing. Ah. Oh. Oh, my goodness. I'm so loud. <laughs> Can y'all hear me? Hmm. Shout out if you can hear me. Mic test. All right. Yay. Okay. I'm wearing my favorite t shirt. It's got little eggs on it. You like that? <laughs> All right. All right. So let's see. Hello to France. Hello to Peru. <sighs> Hello to New Jersey. And New York, Arkansas. Wow. All right. We are all over the place. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the news. So we're going to talk about that today. And uh, I'm going to answer your questions as usual. But because everything on the news is like mm, on fire, like everything's on fire and everybody is impatient and cranky, not without reason, you know, cooped up. A lot of us are cooped up and whatnot. I just want everyone from the get to just kind of in the chat, make sure that we are trying our best to be polite to each other and not get all cranky and jump to conclusions and things like that. Because also remember, we are from all over the world and some people's English is not as good as some other people's. And so, you know, their tone can be misconstrued. So on today's live stream, in today's chat, we're all going to be super cool with each other, right? Because we're all here because we love fashion and we want to learn and we want to socialize with other people who want to learn about more about fashion and talk fashion. So we have this common thing. So let's get started. Uh, what's the first question? What are your thoughts on the coronavirus and its effects it's having on the fashion industry? So that is a, you know, that's a good question because, you know, fashion is global, coronavirus is global, and it's a major economics issue because it means a lot of jobs literally all over the world. So even if you're in a country that's not as severely affected by coronavirus in terms of people's health, you know, you might be a contractor for a company who is in a country that is severely affected. And if their business goes out of business, then you are not getting those contracts. And, and so it's just this chain reaction. And right now, you know, for a while, um, you know, because China was so affected by coronavirus and people were not going into the office, they were not going to factories and, you know, all these production and sampling things were on hold. And a lot of Chinese uh, places were doing like bare minimum work for existing contracts and not taking on any new people. Um, so a lot of projects were being postponed. I've talked to some designers about that, like they were trying like to start a new line, but they couldn't because like everyone was playing it super safe in terms of who they were working with and what new contracts they were picking up and how many workers they would have on hand to work on these new projects. And, uh, you know, moving forward, that's not going to be the only country. I mean, China is not the only country that does production. There's a lot of production, but it's not the only one. Lots of places in Southeast Asia. Um, so, yeah, moving forward, it's going to be a sourcing thing. So, I mean, I haven't, like, I don't have, like, a prepared thesis about it, but these are just some of the things that are going on in my head. It's just always, like, you know, just because, you know, one country kind of gets over it doesn't mean the entire economy is going to, let me rephrase that. When a, a person's body gets better, obviously that's the priority is for people's bodies to get better. But when people's bodies do get better, better, it's they're going to be domino effects on the economy afterwards. And I know a lot of people are not interested in fashion and they think it's superfluous and, you know, 
whatever the crap they think. But the fact of the matter is, it is, it turns a lot of money. It's a lot of jobs. It's a lot of, it's a combination of small business and huge global conglomerates. So, uh, you know, little tidbits maybe that you've heard in the news, the Met Gala, which is normally the first week of May every year in New York, that has been postponed. But no one has uh, said concretely when it's actually going to be. And uh, LVMH, they announced that they're going to... Um, <clears throat> Man, I'm so loud. LVMH has announced that they're going to be using their cosmetics factories to produce hand sanitizer for free for... Uh, for France, they're just donating all this um, hand sanitizer made in the Dior and Givenchy and Guerlain cosmetics factories. They're producing them there and distributing all over for France, uh, across France for free, which is amazing. Um, so, yeah, just at a business economics thing, it's going to be major just beyond the health concerns. <sighs> all right. So that was super uh, uplifting and optimistic. <laughs> I know it, it's like, you know, when you have a lot of bad news, you just kind of go back and forth from being miserable, but also just like, you know, having a little dark humor about it. And then also just, you know, let's see. What's going on with these questions? Hello, hello. Hello from Nebraska. Hi, Nebraska. Do, do, do. Hello to Oregon, Ohio, North Carolina, uh, da, 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 Michigan, Oklahoma. I thought those were flowers on your shirt. No, they're eggs. They're little fried eggs. <laughs> Uh, da, da, San Francisco. Hello, San Francisco. I'm in Oakland. We are all, what is it? We're on lockdown. What is it? Shelter in place. What's the official term? I don't know. <sighs> Waving from across the bay. Hello, Massachusetts, Indiana, Philippines, Washington. So much. Okay. Monterey. Sorry, your day was scrappy. Which one is better for designing dresses, painting colors or pencil colors? Neither. Markers. Because paints are slow and, you know, basically color pencils are even slower. Uh, and for strictly for designing, not for fashion illustration, but strictly for designing markers is the best because you like drop the color. It's super fast. You don't have to mix paints. You don't have to wait for paint to dry. And you're laying down color really fast and you don't have to like painstakingly color in with color pencil, uh, which takes forever. So yeah. Mm -hmm. This thing likes to scroll by itself. It makes me crazy. Do, do, do. Detroit. Do you think the United States should manufacture more instead of outsourcing to China? In general, yes. Just in general, you know, because, you know, I'm all about domestic manufacturing, producing locally, you know, especially if that's where you're selling. Australia, New Zealand. Hello, hello. I get a lot of people wanting to buy patterns for my designs. I draft on dart pa dot paper, excuse me. How does one go about digitizing and getting their patterns printed? Uh, I guess you'd have to work with a pattern maker who does specialize in digital patterns and have the equipment to, because I don't have a lot of experience with this, but from my understanding is you take your paper patterns and then you set them up on this special grid made for that sort of thing. 
and you scan in like the pertinent points. So you need that grid, you need the software and you need the printer. And so you need to talk to someone who has that. So you, your best bet would be uh, a pattern maker who specializes in digital patterns or maybe even a professional grader. Do, do, do. Can I do fashion designing as a part-time job? Not really. It takes much time. Unless you're like a freelancer and you take on, you know, random projects here and there. Hello to Virginia. Hello, hello. What did you miss? I don't know. <laughs> do, do, do. Okay. Oh, Y'all are talking to each other. That's good. That's good. Vancouver, Australia, Puerto Rico, Maryland. Have you ever draped other people's projects? No. Come to think of it. I've only ever made patterns and draped things and then made patterns for my own designs. I've never worked as a pattern maker or in the kind of product development line at a fashion company or even done it as a favor for anyone. The only time I have done draping for a design that wasn't mine was in school when I was learning it. So Cal, do, 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 that's all. I love fried eggs. That's all we have in the fridge due to lockdown. Just, yeah, people are getting creative in the kitchen for sure. Connecticut, Serbia, Peru, France. Yeah. Okay. South Carolina, South California. So Cal, okay. Virginia Beach. What are your thoughts on online fashion design schools? Do, do you think they would provide the, the needs, the needed experience to learn fashion design skills? Mm, I do know that there are uh, good programs out there. So for sure, you know, you can learn the skills uh, with the right program. I know. So I used to teach at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco, and uh, they do have an extensive online program. I know this because I created, I wrote, uh, created a class for their online program, a fashion illustration class, which meant I videotaped tons of illustration demos for that class. And so the, these programs exist and some of them are really good. Um, and if you live in a remote location or you're in a situation where you need to have a flexible schedule, like say you have kids, um, this can be really good. If you are able to go on campus, I really, um, you know, if it's not like a complete necessity that you be online, I would recommend that you go in person because there's so much networking you do with your fellow classmates in school and uh, learning in class, you know, hands on with your teacher, no matter how good the demo is, it's just better. And a lot of people are learning that now because because of COVID-19 people are putting their stuff online or trying to teach stuff online. And a lot of teachers haven't done it before, especially art school teachers where that's not their expertise. And so they exist. You can get degrees. There are some good ones. You need to do your research, but if you have the option, I think an in-person program would be better. Um, and maybe you can look into a program where you can take some classes online and some classes uh, in person. Like maybe you do your studio classes in person and then you do more of your, your liberal arts requirements like your English classes online. Do you think that the extra free time on our hands will lead to more creativity? No. I mean, it really depends on the kind of person you are. I don't think that you should put so much pressure on yourself to be super productive. Like, yes, you should try. I, I believe people should be trying to live their lives as kind of normally as they possibly can for their own mental well-being, you know, um, get up, shower, 
eat your kind of normal times, you know, check in with your friends online or via text or whatever and try to get some work done every day. But I don't think it does anyone any good to just like try to push themselves unnecessarily because this is these are stressful times. You you don't have all this spare time just because wow, I have all this spare time and everything is wonderful and I'm so at peace and I can do all this drawing because trust me, listen, look. These are my watercolor pencils. They've been sitting on my desk for a week. And I'm like, I do have a little bit extra time. Maybe I should want to doodle. No, I've done no doodling. I've done no sketching because my brain is like on creative freeze. I'm like, okay, make the video, make the podcast, do the live stream, do the bare minimum, um, mess around on Twitter, don't have a heart attack, uh, go grocery shopping. And I just, everything is like, ah, uh. so if you can, that's awesome. And, you know, you should carve out some time where you're not like laying around in your bed and like staring at the ceiling, but, you know, try to get out of your pajamas and sit at your desk and, you know, try to be a little bit proactive every day, but don't beat yourself up if you're not writing like, you know, whole symphonies or something. How is it in California? Oklahoma seems always the last to know and be informed. Ooh. Uh, California is, we have, you know, it's hard to say because there's not adequate testing in the U S at all. Uh, but according to the current numbers, California has the third highest number of COVID-19 cases and it's New York has the most. And then after that is Washington state and then California. And it looks like more of those cases are located in the San Francisco Bay area where I am than they are in Los Angeles. So we in the Bay area, six counties in the Bay area are on shelter in place, which means that we are legally not allowed to leave the house except for, very specific things like going to work, going to the doctors, going to grocery shopping, uh, things like that. And uh, yeah, and, and it's hard to tell how people are feeling because everybody is by themselves. And, you know, Twitter is mostly for angry people. I think you have to remember that. It's like, yeah, you can get your news on Twitter and, you know, follow like legitimate doctors who are who have studied infectious disease and, you know, follow the world health organization for news updates. But you just got to remember a lot of the time Twitter is like run by mad people, by angry people. And so that's not like a really great indication of how people are doing. And yeah, I do use Twitter for my work and I do have friends on Twitter, but you just have to take Twitter with a grain of salt. You really do. Hmm. Listen to this. Like, anyone want to connect and talk fashion? And then she posted her Insta. I think you should do that. You know, this is a... Gr I don't know why y'all aren't taking advantage um, in these live chats to make friends. Like, I love it when people start talking to each other and helping each other in these chats. You know, get to know people, make friends, especially those of you who don't live in a fashion capital and there are not around a lot of fashion people. And that's why I have my Facebook group. If you're not in that group, you should definitely join. People are always like sharing work and giving critiques and sharing fashion news. And I do that sometimes. Like it's not really about me. So it's not me constantly posting. It's like mostly other people posting their work and talking about fashion and talking about ideas about fashion. So yeah, just networking and getting to know people and, you know, having that outlet is also really good. Do you do, do how valid do you think using 3D visualizing software to communicate design is? I used, I don't actually know how to pronounce that, closed. Professionally, I'm wondering if it could replace traditional flats and sketches. Yes, that's definitely where the industry of, is moving. So if you are using 3D software and you're actually getting your samples made based off of how well you're rendering come out good for you you're a step ahead of a lot of people there's gonna there's still plenty of traditional industry where people are looking at flats and doing it but i know that you know 3d is the future 3d cuts down on a lot of um 
you know, questions. And it's better to visualize on the 3D and, you know, spin the model around and really see how it purport, like the proportions work on the body and how things drape. And it's not perfect. And the reason why it's per not perfect is because gravity. I, out of all the simulations that I've seen, I think that the biggest issue is gravity. So that when you are thinking about what fabrics you're going to apply you know, especially to drapey things. Like if you have like a fitted tailored suit jacket, gravity is not that big of a deal. But when you're talking about anything that's draping or falling or uh, ruching or shearing, those kinds of things, you know, the overall look can be really different as to how gravity is applied to different fabrics. And that's going to be a thing, but that doesn't certainly doesn't apply to every single style of clothing. So, yeah, I think it will eventually replace that just like, you know, Adobe Illustrator flats have replaced hand sketches over time. So do you follow men's fashion? If so, what shoes designer spoke to you this season? Uh, I do follow it a little bit, just like here and there, not a whole lot. And I don't I don't really follow men's runways but one of my favorite blogs is fashionbeans.com and it is a menswear blog and that one is like less about runways than it is about trends and uh like all price points shopping in different categories and also grooming like what trends in grooming for uh for men uh, what hairstyles are hip and then also personal style. Like they'll do a feature on some sort of celebrity within the fashion world or not about who has really great personal style. So it's really like a wholesome, like holistic, I guess, uh, menswear blog that I love to keep tabs on. And I also follow them on Pinterest. So I'm more into checking out men's fashion in those terms and they do great features on what are the coolest sneakers lately and what are the coolest dress shoes lately and what are the coolest jackets uh, men are wearing or, you know, how to like 10 ways to dress a navy blazer. So like kind of like modern how p people are wearing things more than what's on the the men's runways. And so if you're interested in that, fashionbeans.com is really fantastic. They have a ton of great articles. Of course, you know, a lot of fashion blogs are on hiatus right now because everything is crazy, but yeah. <sighs> so Mr. Marzette is asking, has there been any movies or shows that anyone has been inspired by lately? Feel free to drop your answers in the chat and share that. All right, San Francisco and Texas. This thing. Whoa. Where? Oh, sorry, guys. Sometimes this thing scrolls on its own. Just bloop, bloop. Can you share your experience as a fashion design lecturer and any advice, especially for a fresh graduate, to be one? You want to be a fashion design lecturer? Um... If you've just recently graduated and want to go into teaching, uh, I honestly think that you should work in the industry for a few years before you go into teaching because it there are a lot of things you can't learn in school, a lot of things that you know you will learn in the industry, and it only helps your teaching. Like when I was speaking, well on YouTube and when I was in university, you know, I pulled so many references and ideas and, you know, proof of concept from my years working in the industry. You know, there's no way I could have gone from school to being a full-fledged, you know, lecturer on my own and not like a TA or something because there's just too many, there's just so much to learn. You just can't cram it into one degree. I have a BS in fashion design intern at Alex Wang for four months in New York, worked in costumes six years and wanted to get in back into fashion. All applicant 
you and say, I need three to five years of experience. Mm. If you watch my video uh, interview with New York designer, Melissa Kalamia, Kalamia she uh, goes over a lot of tips on how to get into the, the job market. And she didn't have like a, like a gap where she wasn't working in fashion, but at the same time, she goes over a lot of, you know, how to approach companies and what to say in those cold call emails and, you know, tips and tricks. She goes over a lot of that stuff. So I would recommend you watch that and take her advice. Hmm. Uh, do you have any tips on finding work online in fashion during lockdown? Well, I, I'd have to say that, yes, you also should watch the interview with Melissa. Uh, you know, she has a lot of advice on looking for work. If you're looking for like freelance work, I still think that what she says applies about like getting out there and emailing and following up and like sending small samples of your work and then just getting really specific about how you would love to help them on a singular project and, you know, things like that. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like skipping through all this stuff where you guys are talking to each other, which is fantastic, but that's, that's the prolonged silence. What should I do if my creative mind is not working? Um, here's what you don't do. You do not sit at your desk staring at nothing, trying to draw stuff. And you do not lay in bed staring at the ceiling, trying to come up with something. You really have to go out and look for new things and really look at new things, research new things, do new things. And if you're currently in a country where that is ill-advised, then of course you do need to stay at home, but that's what the internet is for. And I do recommend that you pursue things that are things that you normally do not do. So let's pretend that you are obsessed with anime. You're constantly influenced by anime and that's your big jam. You need to just not look at anime. You need to look at things that you feel are the opposite of anime for a while to get your brain looking at new things. Because the reason your brain is locked or one of the reasons is because you're just looking at the same stuff constantly. Um, and right now, because of COVID-19 and or just people are learning about these things because of COVID-19, there are a lot of, you know, uh, free services available that you can check out where you can do online tours of museum exhibits. So you just go online and you can go through different museum exhibits. And so it's, yeah, so it's like going to a museum, but you're staying at home. And, you know, this applies to all of you who are trying to look for different inspiration sources. You know, I think the Metropolitan is showcasing free operas every Monday night or something like that. You know, there are a lot of resources out there that are becoming available and you should take advantage of that so that you're feeding your brain new things for you to absorb and think about and kind of rattle in your brain so you can express them creatively. <sighs> so I'm a costume designer. All of my design comes from an analysis of source, material, play, musical, dance, etc. Does fashion design start with an analysis stage or do you start with research? Uh... I don't know what would be the difference between analysis and uh, well, okay. Uh, <clears throat> in terms of what you do specifically, that would determine that would be determined by how long you've been working and what your level is. If you're one of the big boss people, you are the one creating the direction for the next collection, and so 
you are meeting with merchandisers about how well the last collection sold, what sold the best, you know, it's number crunching plus creativity. And so you're taking into consideration, you know, what's responding with customers as you move into the next season. And then if you are lower on the totem pole and you're working as, you know, assistant designer, associate designer, you know, you're being given the research and then you start doing more of the technical designing the nitty gritty blouses and drawing the flats. Hmm. Hello, hello. Hello from Hawaii. The libraries will be closed starting tomorrow. I'm in college for fashion design in Toronto. If anything, I feel even more confused as to where to start as a designer when companies and brands have 10 person teams in creative production and sampling. All I know is I have beautiful ideas. I'm not sure where to start. I also need income to help me start up any advice. Uh, I don't know. Your question is very strange because you say you're in college now. So right now, if you're, if you're studying fashion design now, you mean you need to be focusing on doing your assignments as best as you can. And I'm not going to sit here and kind of critique your program. I don't know anything about your program, et cetera, but you're confused as to where to start as a designer when companies and brands have 10 person teams and create like you're, you don't need to worry about that. You're in school. Um, you need income to help start up. Like, so what are you trying to do? Like leave college and start a company or you're lost at school. If you're lost at school, you need to talk to have a conversation with your teachers about your specific progress. And, if you're trying to leave college to do startup, that's a whole different kit and caboodle. Hmm. I just joined your Facebook. I'm always reluctant to talk to folk as I get so wrapped up in what I'm working on. I can be a terrible new friend. That's everybody, okay? Everyone is so shy and there's like five... Uh, there's like 5% of the world is brave from the get very get, but people are really just kind to each other. They watch themselves in the years. I've had that Facebook group. I've only issued a warning to one person about being unkind. And, uh, they've kind of stopped posting, which is good. Cause like, you know, you can have differences opinion on aesthetic, but I don't handle unkind. And, um, so yeah, you know, just go for it. And it's totally fine if you share work and you announce in your original post that you're not ready for critique. Some people aren't, it's fine, but it's a brave first step to share work. So you can, you can start by doing that and be like, I'm trying to be more brave about sharing work. I can't really handle a lot of criticism right now, but this is my first step, you know? Yes, join the Facebook group. The link to the Facebook group is always like in the description box of every single one of my videos. There's links to all my social media, you know, my Patreon, my my website, blah, blah, blah. And the link to the Facebook group is always there. The alarm just went off for curfew here in Puerto Rico. Wow, you have that? That's That's bananas. How does that work? Is that do you have like outside alarms, like it, like a outdoor intercom system that blares out a sound that it's curfew, or is it like connected to your phones? Because I know here in the U.S. you get an Amber Alert on your phone, and it just goes directly to your phone. Um, Amber Alerts are when kids get abducted, and they have like a and they'll say something like, this child was taken in this car with this license plate and stuff. And it goes directly to your phone. It goes to like everyone's phone. <sighs> Whoa. Hi, 
hi Zoe I'm going to teach fashion design at the local university this semester any advice my advice to new teachers is always you know connect with your students right away and what I used to do in university was I used to give a questionnaire out well, paper questionnaire out to every single student in all of my classes. And it had slots for their name, their student ID number, their email and their phone number so I can get a hold of them whenever. And then I would have questions like, what is the name you prefer to go by in class? Because sometimes that's not their legal name. But, you know, a lot of Asian students, they, they, pick a different nickname or a lot of trans kids haven't had the chance to change their name legally yet, but would like to go by a different name, all these different things. And I had, um, I had an older student once she was in her forties and she liked to be called queen of the universe. Cause that's what her son called her. And I said, that's just too long. Can I call you queenie? So we did that. <laughs> and then just things like, what are you expecting out of this class? Where are you skill level wise? You know, what are the things that you hope to learn in this class? And, you know, things like that. So I can get a handle on, you know, my students and where they're coming from and what they're hoping to learn and what they feel their weaknesses are. So I can kind of pay special attention to that. And of course, I had the luxury to do that because my classes were anywhere from like 12 to 18 students, really small. My freshman color classes went up to 25 students, but that's still real small. But just to get a general idea, like if you see a lot of people talking about, you know, oh, I don't know what trend analysis is and apparently you have to learn it or something, you know, then you can keep an eye out and do some little background research on that. But really just like connect with your students from the get, get this information from them, you know, learn their names and create that connection from the get. Canary Islands? What? Have I ever had someone join us from the Canary Islands? That's awesome. <laughs> uh, what's not awesome is everybody, everything is closed. Ugh. Okay. I'm missing some threads of conversation. That's fine. Y'all are talking to each other. Uh, uh, the men's wear blog. Hold on. I'll find the link for y'all. Okay, I put the link to the menswear blog in the chat. So scroll down and get it. Da, 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 da. The Forbidden Yellow documentary looks really interesting. It was good. The, the documentary on Guape, you should definitely check that out if you're interested in her work. Hello to Switzerland. Do you think a very introverted person can, with no network can make it big in fashion? No. Uh, you can be an introverted person who networks anyway, you know, they can make it in fashion. You need to know people to make things work because mm, just you can't do everything by yourself. That's just not how it works. And there are a lot of things that happen because you hear things down the pipe, like, uh, you know, a lot of freelance jobs. You know, I found my first sales rep because from a friend who worked in the industry, you know, you do, you do need to either meet people online, go to events, make friends. You just have to. And I, I, I'm an introvert. My husband is more introverted than I am. I socialize a little bit more than he does, but even he will kick his own butt to get out of the house. He, he produces a newsletter. He doesn't work in fashion, but same difference for every industry. He is very introverted, but he does leave the house on occasion and meets up with other people. He produces a newsletter. And so he's just really showing his industry the kind of knowledge that he has, but also connecting with people who find his content interesting. He's on, uh, um, active on Twitter, which is perfect for his industry. And you can do it. But you can't do it without knowing anybody.
which university is best for fashion design? And that is a question I get all the time. And the answer is it depends on the kind of designer you are. And so when you are like, you can literally Google best fashion design universities and you'll get lists. Every website has their own ranking and the way they rank and, you know, all these lists and stuff. But what you need to do is look at those lists and look up those universities and look at their senior collections. Look at their work and see if like, oh, their style jibes with mine. And I don't mean like specific style. There are schools that are going to be more avant-garde and they're going to be schools that produce more wearable stuff. And you need to pick which one works better for you. Is now a good time to start a creative YouTube channel or with all the madness best to hold off? I don't see why not because YouTube is completely online and so people are going to be looking for more things to do at home uh, and also online. Like everyone is binging Netflix and listening to podcasts like crazy. Like I have run out of podcast episodes of all my favorite podcasts and so now I'm listening to my kind of like my second tier, like they're not my favorite, but they're still pretty good sometimes, you know? Uh, so yeah, this is a great time. And honestly, um, even though I'm producing fewer videos, uh, these days, my watch minutes are still high because one, my content is evergreen. Like there's, except for these live streams, there's nothing that's so dated, you know, an illustration tutorial is an illustration tutorial. But uh, also because these days I got a little jump because people are just like online and just watching videos. Uh, hello from PA, Pennsylvania. I'm struggling with that. I may not be able to continue with school after getting my AFA in fashion design. Do companies prefer bachelors or will my associates be okay in finding jobs? It's really, it's the associates will limit the kinds of jobs you get. Uh, that's definitely true. Um, it's, it's just like anything. It's like two years of experience versus four years of experience and a, an associates versus a bachelor's versus a master. So the more information you have, the more education, the more experience you have, you know, you're going to get the, the more higher rank jobs, but you just have to go for it and you have to show people like, oh, I had this other job and these are the things I learned and this is what my work looks like. And so I have an associate, but I have these skills and abilities that match people with a bachelor's. Why is my phone blowing up? Leave me alone. Uh, Zoe, did you watch Next in Fashion? No, I did not. Uh I kind of I wanted to, and it was on my my watch list, but then a friend of mine spoiled the ending and they sent me an Instagram uh, DM and they're like, look at this girl's profile. She is the winner of next in fashion. And I'm like, why did you tell me that? I think that he knows I don't watch project runway and he was going to, he was assuming that I wasn't going to watch next in fashion, but yeah. So it's kind of, it's kind of like, um, I mean, I, I guess I should watch it at some point. I know Melissa enjoyed it way more than project runway. And so that kind of got me interested again. Um, but it's kind of like not as urgent, but I've been hearing good things. Do you think getting a master's in fashion is too much? Uh, I don't think it's too much. It depends. You know, if you want to teach, most universities expect a master's in order to teach. Uh, if you want to really deep dive in a particular area of fashion, um, it's good to get a master's. If you feel that your bachelor's wasn't sufficient, then you can get a bachelor's. You know, there are programs where some people 
they will go get their master's because a certain school has a reputation of giving like really big presentations for their master's program graduates. And that could be like a publicity bump in the very beginning of their career. And that's why they do that. So that's an option. So it, it depends on what you're going for. Hello to Baja. I wanted to ask if you want, if I want to make a portfolio to the 2D, 3D element, the photos I have to put must be my moulage work or could I use one from the web? What do you mean, could I use one from the web? Well, first of all, everything you put in your portfolio must be your own. And process work, like moulages, toiles, whatever, those things are only interesting if I also see the final result. Because unless you are applying to be, I mean, even if you are applying to be a draper, people want to see the end result of your draping. And so it's not enough to have pictures of muslins. It's just here's my process. Here's my first muslin. Here's my first, uh, first sample. Here are the revisions. And here's the final, like that kind of process is nice to look at. And then you have this beautiful final result. If you have only the final result, that's fine too. But just to have the drape, it's not in you. What do you mean? My connection's unstable. So if you're applying for a design job at a company, and none of the job requirements require you to do any draping or pattern drafting. It's not necessary for you to have moulage work photos. Hi, Zoe. Just made my day better. Thanks, Shauna. <laughs> Are you guys feeling a little bit better? Just like jamming down, talking to people in the chat, you know, kind of socializing because you can't leave the house. I hope so. Because that was kind of like my goal. I know that in the U.S., a lot of people like to celebrate St. Patrick's Day by going out and getting drunk. And some of the bigger cities like New York, like San Francisco, we, we can't do that. So we're just like chilling at home. I'm not a huge drinker. Uh, so I'm not really missing out on that. But, you know, I do have sympathy. I, I did go through my own party phase. So I do have sympathy for people who are still like to go out for a good night. But yeah. Do, do, do. How's your book coming along? Terribly. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's fine. It's fine. I have a question. I just did this the other day. Okay. This is, can you all see this? Okay. This is the design process timeline that I'm putting in the beginning of the book. Cause we're, we're uh, the book talks a lot about design process. So I have like a basic outline of the design process in the beginning. So if I put this timeline and I have all these things and you're supposed to do these things in order from top to bottom, right? If I have these things where it's like next to each other and this one is by itself and this one is by itself, but these are staggered, does it make sense that these things are done at the same time? This is done after these things. These things are done at the same time. And then these things are done after these, but also at the same time. And then this, and then this, and then this, and then this. Does it make sense like that? Like if I lay out the information like that. Let me know in the comment. Thank you. Ah, speaking of my book that I love and hate so much. <laughs> Hi, Zoe. It's me, Samir from Amsterdam. Hi, how are you? What's going on with all your stuff? Let me know. Drop me a comment. Uh... I know you're like making some decisions on the next collection you wanted to do while you had your other work that you needed to do when we talked, right? Mm -hmm. do, do. Why do period films always win the Oscars? Because the Academy is full of a bunch of stuck up people who just assume period dramas are more serious. 
I don't know. I uh, hashtag Oscar is so white. Oscar is so white. I don't pay attention to the Oscars much anymore. I like looking at the red carpet because just like briefly, I don't do like a big red carpet analysis or anything, but I like looking at red carpet stuff because I like looking at what people are wearing. But, you know, in terms of who's getting awards, I got real excited when Parasite won because that movie was a bomb. And, you know, I'm Korean and I grew up watching Korean dramas and movies. And so I've been a big fan of a lot of the actors in the movie and people making the movie and also just, you know, um, just Korean movies I've always felt deserved more uh, attention. And so I was really excited about that. But for the most part, you know, I could only handle, eh, that, that's too much of a rant. But like, yeah, like, I don't really pay too much attention. Like random things will catch my attention. Like the time they announced the wrong winner and that was all over the news. Parasite was all over the news. Um, there was one award where like Jennifer Lawrence tripped a, tripped on the stairs. That was funny, but you know, her dress was so massive. That was a, you know, that surprised nobody, you know, things like that, but I don't really pay attention too much. Um, let's see. Okay, someone is writing a bunch of stuff in not English, and uh, I don't know what to do about that. Okay. Oh, oh my God, there's so much stuff. Hold on, let me just scroll through this really fast. Best way to make money as a freelancer, make sure you get paid. Make sure you set your terms. Make sure you have a contract um, that you send off and get signed by everybody before you start the work. Brooklyn, do, do, do. just join the FB group, good, do, 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 how to choose colors, I have so many videos on that, please go watch my color theory playlist, do, 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 how to, I'm working on clothing line brand, how can I start, please go watch my how to start a fashion collection, uh, how to start a fashion company playlist, the curfew is directly from phone, oh, okay, that's cool, do, 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 Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Do, 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 do. Bum, ba, bum. Okay. Thank you for that. I've just deleted all his stuff. Bum, ba, ba, bum. Wait, now I missed my spot. He was writing so much stuff. He's like messed up my scroll. <sighs> How am I today? I'm okay. Listen, yesterday I had to go to the doctor for something that was completely unrelated to COVID-19. I do not have any symptoms, but I had to go to the doctor because I'm an old lady and, uh, you know, these things are important and I had to go and I was like in such a panic. I was freaking out all weekend long and, uh, about going to the doctor, but it was fine. I got good news. I, there's like so many hand sanitizer pumps at the doctors. I hand sanitized my, my hands like maybe six times in half an hour because I was so paranoid. And then I didn't touch anything and nobody talked to me in the hallway because my resting bitch face is on point. And I am, I have been told that I'm incredibly unapproachable when I'm just walking down the street or down the hallway. Like people, you know, when I'm on camera, when I'm talking to you all, I'm smiling and I'm engaged because I like you all mostly. And just, you know, I like teaching and talking to y'all, but like when I'm just walking, People have told me many times that I'm incredibly intimidating and unapproachable looking. And that is working out in my favor these days. And then so Monday I got home from the doctors and I spent the whole rest. Of the, I, I took a two hour nap and I snacked. I got nothing done because I was in this like, you know, when you have a very like you're feeling very anxious about something and the moment has passed and your whole body relaxes and you're just like. 
I was like that yesterday. And then <laughs> But tomorrow, the, today was much better. I actually got some work done today and, you know, got um, was not freaking out about a million things today. So that's always nice. <laughs> Thanks for asking. What major changes do you see fashion having in the next 10 years? What I think will happen or what I'm hoping will happen? Because right now, and has been for the, the past couple of years, the focus on sustainability has been revolving around materials. And there's a lot of materials information out there on producing with more sustainable materials, recycled materials, organic materials, using dead stock, using scrap waste, all these things. And I think the attention needs to turn to how we treat people who are working like the entire supply chain from interns not being paid anything, which is bananas, all the way to, you know, garment sewers who are also being paid pennies. And what I would love to see happen is people having enough respect for the people who need to get paid in the garment supply chain to understand that they also need to pay more per garment. And I think that's the next natural step in sustainability and in making the fashion industry better for people all over the world. And yeah, that's, that's generally where I'm hoping. Cause right now, I mean, not to say that we can't do better with materials and process, but we're getting there. Like the 3D programs we were talking about before, that's going to help reduce the sampling turnaround time and the money spent on sampling. So that's one direction. Materials is one direction that we can keep pursuing. But this whole other section on how we're treating people because we're so obsessed with making too much stuff, you know, that's got to be the next direction, I believe. Hi, Zoe. Hope you're well in California. Would you be able to do a video on best practices and insight on fashion networking outside of design process and production and more so in marketing and sales? Not really, because I have never worked in marketing and sales. And so I don't like to talk about things I don't know enough about. I don't believe in talking out of my butt. Um, but just in terms of general fashion industry networking, I do have a networking video and I don't see why it would not apply to other aspects of the fashion industry because, you know, it's, it's all the same thing. It's like you need to go out to fashion events and talk to people and form genuine connections with people. And, you know, when I tell designers to go network, I'm not saying only network specifically with other designers. You're, you're networking with business people, with PR people, with salespeople, so you can branch out your own digital Rolodex, so to speak. So um, there's that. And also, you know, if you want, if you're in school or you're thinking about going to school, uh, those of you, it can help to also attend a school that has more than one kind of fashion major. I know there are a lot of schools where the only fashion program is like one major fashion design, but there are also other schools where they uh, have fashion design, fashion merchandising, fashion marketing, and a lot of them take like a lot of the, the same classes. Like in my color theory classes at uh, the university, I had all the fashion students because every single fashion student, fashion journalism, fashion, like every single student had to take color, freshman color class. And so, you know, you start to get to know students in all these different majors and cultivate those relationships throughout your school. Do, do, do. Watching from Soweto. Zoe, you have open my heart and mind to fashion. I'm in the middle of switching careers from service design to full on fashion. I plan to go back to fashion school. Awesome. Good luck with that. 
do, do, do. A lot of people are talking about selling clothes in Second Life. If someone wanted to, I would be very happy to read about people's experiences selling clothes in Second Life on something like our Facebook group. If anyone wanted to start that conversation in there, I would love that because I've I have no experience with that, but I'm always interested in learning about new stuff. So that would be awesome. I know the light is getting really weird in here. I have a lamp on, but the sun is setting. So here in Canary Islands, the police patrol goes around and check out people who uh, don't go out. We find out everything through TV news and every web page keeps updated with all the news. Wow. Yeah, I saw this video, uh, I think on Twitter the other night, where uh, big police SUVs were driving through the main streets in New Orleans and telling everyone to stop partying and go home because they were, you know, basically just sharing spit too much, pretty much. Hmm. What kind of jobs and projects do fashion illustrators take on? Uh, no, 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 no. There's a lot of things. Uh, some of the things that I've done in the past, well, one of my favorite things. And if anyone wanted to hire uh, me to do this again, I'm your girl. I had so much fun is live fashion illustration. So um, a fashion brand who has many boutiques they hired me to sit in one of their boutiques around the bay area i'm trying to be vague because um yeah i think their nda is still good yeah <laughs> so i wasn't all they asked me not to publicize it on social media because they know i have a social media presence but so basically, there's a brand, they have many boutiques, they have one in the Bay Area, and they hired me to sit in the boutique and do illustrations, like really fast, 15-minute illustrations of their customers wearing their stuff in the boutique. And it's so fun. It's so fun. It's a dr an adrenaline rush like you wouldn't believe. So I was sitting there with my markers because that's the fastest thing. And I was just like sketching super, super fast. No templates, nothing. Just boom, boom, boom. Knock them out. And like for the most part, you know, most people don't want to pose. They want to like go out and keep shopping or flit around and drink wine. And so what we would do is they would put on or hold the thing that they just bought. And I would snap a photo of them with my phone and I would do a really fast 15 minute sketch based on the photo. And they would come pick up their sketch, you know, during the event and stuff. So I've done stuff like that and it's so fun. I've also, you know, I way long time ago, I used to have like a portfolio of illustrations and people will contact me and ask me for the rights to use them. And prices for fashion illustration, the thing is you give them two prices. You give them prices for using the illustration and then you give them a price for exclusive rights so that you can't sell the illustration anymore. You can have it in your portfolio selling, saying you did this for a client, but you're not allowed to sell that image anymore. And so of course you charge more for exclusive rights and uh, some people, they don't want, they don't care. They don't want the exclusive rights. And so they'll take the cheaper version, but then you can keep selling that same artwork. So there's that I've sold prints on uh, stores like Etsy. I've also done events where I sold prints and, um, you know, Oh, I used to do fashion illustrations for fashion forecasting reports. This was back in like my early 20s, back when I lived in L.A. And uh, so basically fashion forecasting companies, they create these massive mood boards. And sometimes they need some fashion figures thrown in there to kind of like go with the rest of the stuff that they collage for their mood board. And so I would be hired to do the fashion illustrations for that. Um, yeah. Those are just some fun things that you can do as an illustrator. Mm, Trinidad and Tobago. Any advice for someone who got an MFA in fashion from the Caribbean trying to get a job in the U.S.? 
Well, I mean, I don't know how all that works, but you need to make sure that you are legally allowed to work in the U.S. because that's going to be a question that that's going to come up. And uh, yeah, those of you all who are looking for job seeking advice, I really recommend that you watch that interview with Melissa Kalamia because we go over job hunting a ton. Okay, we, we talk like at least half the interview just on how to look for work. Do illustrators apply for jobs or do designers keep their fashion favorite illustrator on their team? Uh, both. You know, there, there are people, there are companies that have so much illustration work or that they need someone on staff and like they'll do stuff that is part illustration, you know, part graphics or, you know, part textile design. Um, I have a friend, if you watch my interview and office tour of uh, Taylor and Sage, uh, my two college girlfriends who work there, they do so much print design. They have textile designers who sit there and just develop textiles and illustrate textiles just on staff at the office all the time. Uh, but a lot of illustration work is freelance. Hello to Winnipeg. You stay healthy too. Hi, Shirley. <laughs> just like, I love how in the chat, just ahead of you, it says, anybody interested in costume design? Everyone, Shirley Itzakovich is in the chat. And uh, if you are interested in costume design, you should watch my interview with Shirley. There's a video. It's in my, all the interviews are in their own playlist, interviews with industry professionals. And she talks about being a costume designer in New York, doing uh, theater stuff, and also doing movie and TV stuff, and how to get started in that industry. It's a really great interview. You should go check that out, all you uh, people interested or even vaguely curious about costume design and how it's the same and different from fashion. Do, 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 do. When you publish your book, will there be a digital copy? Probably. Uh, the goal is to sell them online and ship to as many places as possible and then also offer a digital copy uh, that's the goal. That's the plan, Stan. Zoe, how is your friend with the food truck? He was with you at the New York meetup. <laughs> that guy is the one who spoiled the ending of Next in Fashion for me. So he is in the doghouse with me. No. <laughs> He's good. Uh, he uh, sold his truck and he's doing a new food business. He doing he's doing a beer garden. He's branching out and stuff. He's fine. Do mm. do this thing. What is happening? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm just deleting some of this crap in uh Yeah, I don't have any patience for spammers and just buttholes and stuff. So I just, <sighs> I lost my spice. I lost my place. Do, do, do. I know I've been uh, going over, but I feel like today we're just going to hang out for an extra minute. Just because, <sighs> you know, just because. Yeah, the bots are really throwing off my scroll. So I've deleted as many as I can find. I'm doing great besides the coronavirus. The collection I had to put on hold because of personal reasons. It's crazy enough. This whole situation made me realize I only want to do stuff that I love, and that's designing. Good. 
sometimes, you know, things happen and we get a little bit of clarity and that's really what we needed. So good luck with everything. Uh, I love your quote. You can be successful without doing a single show. So do you really need promotion to be successful? Yeah. Promotion and doing fashion shows are completely different. Okay. Um, fashion shows, depending on how it's promoted can actually offer zero percent of the kind of promotion that you want. And so, you know, promoting and being on social media and talking to customers and getting your name in actual magazines that shoppers are actually looking at, you know, getting the attention of sales reps and things like that. that's different from shows. I do have sewing videos. Go see my garment construction playlist. Book makes total sense, but you should put a key on the bottom of the page as well. What key would that? Uh, okay. I think I get what you guys are saying about the book thing. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe number it. Yeah. Do, 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 do. Hello, hello. I'm planning to get my first sewing machine. What would you recommend for a first machine? I'm always going to, I'm always going to recommend industrials, especially if you're going to be like in one spot sewing all the time, because they just, they're sturdy and they sew through everything. If you get something really simple, like the Juki that I have in my intro to industrial machines video, it's like a simple, straightforward Juki, no frills. It's a few hundred dollars. Industrial machines, you can even buy used and they're still awesome. Like my overlock machine I bought used. And it was like a billion years old when I got it. It still works beautiful. I bought the single needle Juki back there new. And I've had it for 15 years or something ridiculous like that. And I could still sew through several layers of leather without a problem. Just, you know, make sure that you have oil in the thing. And I demonstrated that in the video, how you lift the thing to get the oil in. But you should talk to whoever you go. Jukis are awesome. Shirley will probably skewer me, but I hate brothers and I don't trust anyone who likes brothers the best. Do, do. Okay. Lately, I'm feeling inspired by saris and Indian fashion. Any tips for designing, sewing, and fabrics? That's kind of a thing. It's like if you're not an Indian person, you need to make sure that you're being inspired by and paying homage without cultural appropriation. It's, you know, make sure you're twisting the inspiration and developing your concepts more. If you are an Indian person, I mean, have fun. Let her rip. Uh, you're still my go-to for all fashion questions. I restarted doing your how to draw a fashion sketch since I still want to get better at that. Good. Good luck. Um, my very first video back in July of 2015, it's still like one of my most viewed videos. <laughs> back when I didn't really know how to edit. So it's like got some long gaps and some long intros. You can tell how old a video is by how long my intros are. Because if you notice, like my, like the videos of the last couple of years, my intros are like, boom. Hi, everyone. Let's do this. Whereas my older videos, they have like a bit of a more of a drag in the beginning. <laughs> hmm. do, do, do. I'm hoping your 10-year forecast comes to fruition. Me too. That would just that. I would love to see that happen. Do, do, do. I'm 
I'm like, sometimes I'll read something. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> do, do, do. What is the time here? 716. Can you do a costume movie review? I have two um, movie review, fashion movie review videos. They're in my fashion movie review playlist. Yes, I have a playlist, so you can go check those out. Mm -hmm. Bye, Dulce. Do, do, do. What's the most profitable niche in fashion accessories? Um, if you're thinking purely profit, purely just how to make the money, it's always going to be the category where people find it easiest to buy things. And that's going to be things that you don't require fitting things that can be gifted easily because they don't have to try things on. It doesn't have to look perfect. It can be, um, so accessories like handbags and wallets and beauty products. Do you think fashion will be more minimalist as we approach hard economic times, like in the 2009 crisis? When I think and what I hope related to what I was saying about where I hope fashion heads in the next 10 years is not so much that it's minimalist, but more investment. And so, you know, even if your style is a little bit more, you know, maximal, maximalist, it's a little more about having a more pared down wardrobe of investment pieces that you wear more often as opposed to, uh, which is minimalist in thinking, but not in style, if you know what I mean. So that people are buying fewer pieces, but buying pieces that they are just going to wear a ton and really fit their style. And there was an article that I, I briefly skimmed few weeks ago where they're talking about is personal style, the future of sustainable fashion. And I thought that was a really interesting take on it because when you have a strong personal style, when you have a strong sense of self and you know what you want, you know what you're going to wear and what really does not work for you. And you know what works on your body and what colors work when you know these things, when you have a strong personal style, you don't buy well, you buy less, far less extra crap that sits in your closet, you know, and I, and, uh, to really understand yourself and to really get to the core of your personal style is the key to not buying a bunch of disposable stuff where you're trying out things. And I know that like when you're younger, especially that could be more difficult because you really don't know what works on your body or maybe your body's made a change and things like that. But for the most part, when you know what works for you, you are very, uh, you're more choosy about how you shop. How, Zoe, how to improve drawing skills? Practice. I have a hundred drawing videos. Okay, maybe not a hundred, but I have a lot. I have, I have my fashion figures, drawing, uh, sketchy, uh, fashion, Ooh, let me try that again. I have my female fashion figures playlist, my male fashion figures playlist. I have my general figure a figure drawing playlist and you should start there. How to illustrator find jobs. I can only find graphic design jobs. Sometimes you just have to cold call companies and see if they're looking. So yeah, contact, you know, a lot of fashion design companies are not going to be looking for like a full fledged fashion illustration. They don't have a lot of need for it. Try, uh, trend forecasting. They do more illustration work for their mood boards. 
You can try, um, I mean, honestly, <laughs> I have the most random clients because they would find me online and try to hire me to do a thing because they're not in a creative field and they are looking for some creative sketch. Like the most I got paid for a single project was a community college in Texas. They wanted just like one beautiful sketch to promote this new program they were starting. And they paid me a lot of money for it. <laughs> so like they're out there, but you do have to look. And you can also um, look into like headhunters and recruiters and stuff. Go look up 24-7. Go look at different job boards. You know, um, I don't know if this is true for illustrators, but I know that Places like LinkedIn and Business of Fashion, they have job boards and like on LinkedIn, people will post when they're looking for someone. They're more like, you know, because LinkedIn is where you post like professional stuff. So they'll post things like uh, we're looking for a designer, we're looking for a tech designer, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, also you need to network and let people know, have an online uh, portfolio set up and be like anyone looking for some cute sketches, here I am. I'm going to Japan at the end of April. Fingers crossed I'll be there for almost a month because my brother is getting married. Congratulations. What can you tell me would be good places to check out? Ooh, I already have some museums and stuff on the list, but I was wondering if there's anything fashion-wise that you would say don't miss. The Costume Museum in Kyoto is world-class. I don't know where in Japan you're going to go. Oh, you say you're going to be there for a month, so you have, like, tons of time. The Kyoto, the Costume Museum in Kyoto is world class. They publish some of the best costume history books in the world. Uh, I have never been. The, I've been to Kyoto, but I spent most of Kyoto sick, and I'm so mad about it, so I didn't get to go. But apparently, the museum is fantastic, so you definitely want to do that. Um, there's, I heard uh, a friend of mine told me the Boro Museum in Tokyo closed. So I'm really upset about that. If you're into art supplies and illustration supplies and stationery as much as I am, there are some places you can go. Sakaido, S-E-K-K-A-I-D-O, that is, that's like Mecca for illustrators, okay? It's five stories. On the outside, it looks like a nondescript five-story business building. The inside is like every square inch of that place is just stuffed full with like all the most amazing pens and pencils and paints and papers and magazines and books and just everything. Sakaido is great. Tokyo Hands is great. So not Tokyo Hands, but Tokyo, T-O-K-Y-U Hands. And they are a massive department store with everything you could possibly need. And they have several departments devoted to stationery and art supplies. And then uh, just walking around uh, Shinjuku and Harajuku. You know, Harajuku has the vintage shopping. Shinjuku has like the the modern shopping. And uh, gosh, there's a lot. Oh, Textile Town. Textile Town, or some people call it Fabric Town, is a street in the center of Tokyo where it's just dozens of fabric stores. So if you're into shopping for fabric and want to look for more fabric or just look at fabric, that's where you go. That's literally the what they call it, Textile Town or Fabric Town. So you can Google it just like that. Ow. Do, do, do. Let's see. Should I stop putting my illustration on IG or can I, uh, cause sometimes people tell me I shouldn't put my ideas on the internet and see it as showing my skills. No, you need to show your skills so people will hire you for stuff. Like ideas, you know, it's like, you know what? It's like BDE to just be like, here are my ideas. And I don't care if you freaking steal them because I can come up with a hundred more tomorrow. Suck it. Okay. That's kind of, that's kind of how I feel about my work is like, 
I post stuff and I don't even think about it. And I post, I, I yell out business ideas in my videos and I post them up in my stories and everything. Cause I don't care. I have 20 more ideas where that came from. Whatever. Sorry. That was loud. I didn't mean to get all loud, but you know what I mean? But yeah, you know, everyone is going to be copying everyone else. And not only that, but sometimes people just design the same thing without even copying. It just happens. Like how many different kinds of t-shirts can you make? So just people are so obsessed with copying and who's copying. Just let it go. Just make more cool stuff. So I'm trying to design patterns for tights and hosiery. Don't know how to go about finding fabrics or starting in general. Any help? I live in New York. Yes, go buy some tights and hosiery and uh, use that as a starting board for your patterns. And then also take those tights and hosiery that you like and go to the fabric store and ask the people. I mean, you live in New York. There, You have a lot of uh, fabric stores at your disposal. Go to the store and be like, I'm looking for something that looks like this. And the fabric people, like, even if they don't know a lot of terms, like if you have that swatch right in front of you, just be like, they'll, they'll help you figure it out. Or they'll tell you right off the bat, we don't have anything like that. Hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you're not feeling so lonely. Good. That was the whole point of this. I mean, I do this every month, but this month, especially. Okay. Do, do, do. I think we'll see a lot of digital presentations due to the pandemic. Yeah. So like I follow some people who are on Twitter. I follow a couple of people who are like real. Uh, what do I want to, what do I want to say? Like they, they post a lot of on behalf of disabled people and disabled people's rights. And when, you know, COVID-19 was causing a lot of trade shows and conferences and things to go online or be canceled, you know, they were really posting angry things about how, oh, it was so hard to do it before for disabled people. And now all of a sudden it's so easy now that no one can go. So what you're saying is basically we could do it before you just didn't want to. So that might be a thing that just stays permanently in the future, this ability to be able to log into conferences and trade shows online. Maybe not physical trade shows where you have to like feel fabric so much, but definitely conferences. I have definitely, um, I mean, the thing with conferences is a lot of it is networking. So they would have to include a special thing about that. But yeah, I think a lot of um, what, we can do online as it benefits a lot of people who, even if you're physically able to, maybe you're not financially able to travel, but you can afford the cost of an online ticket because those will be cheaper, of course, than like a full conference ticket. You know, all these things, you know, people are going to be, I think a lot of people are going to be thinking about these things in the future. Hmm. Which fashion industry is interesting, UK or American fashion? I mean, there's great things in both places. I'm not going to play what's better. They, people have uh, different designers, different designers have different fortes, you know, known for different things, all that good stuff. Thank you. I know a lot of you pay me compliments in the chat. I'm just smiling and thanking you in general. I don't want to read all of them like, Shirley, what are you laughing at? Are you laughing at my brother joke? <laughs> I was actually talking to another designer friend and I was telling her, she told me, she's like, brothers are the worst. I'm like, yes, brother machines are the worst. We're big Juki fans. We do not like brother machines. Whatever, you know. Hmm. Thanks, Coco. Thank you all the stuff. Uh, are you going to have a book tour? <laughs> if any company would like to sponsor me for a book tour, I would be so into it. But I am self-publishing, so I'm not going to have a publisher sending me off to do things. But, you know, if schools wanted to invite me or if schools wanted to incorporate my book in the future for their future curricula, I'd be into it. Do, do, do. What fashion school learn about costume history apart the clothes between 1900 to nowadays? Do they learn 
other time periods. Some people do. Uh, I mean, it goes a lot faster because when I was learning costume history in school, the, the pre 1900 stuff, it went pretty fast because one, we don't reference those trends in fashion so much. It's really important for costume designers to know these periods, but for fashion designers, we don't really reference, you know, panniers and crinolines at quite as much. And I know there's a lot of COVID-19 social distancing fashion pannier jokes, but for the most part, we don't reference it as much as like we reference 20s fashion or 40s fashion and things like that. But also because fashion moved a lot slower before the 1900s, you know, trends change with the speed of information. And so now with the internet, trends move like everything was trendy yesterday, okay? which is kind of the problem with fast fashion and everything. But before 1900, information moved so much slower. And so trends in clothing changed so much slower. Hmm. After what amount of time did you start looking at your drawing and think they are actually good and up to standard for the fashion industry? Mm. Listen, the fashion industry doesn't care about your sketches. They care about your flats. Okay. Sketches are great for your portfolio and I get that, but I just, this kind of question is just kind of self-defeating, like, because everybody grows at different rates you know, I was having this conversation in the comments section of uh, one of my videos where someone was like, how many years did it take you for you to get this good and this fast? And I'm like, mm, I think you want me to give you an answer that will make you feel better. But there's no point in comparing you to me or you to someone else. What you need to do is look back at what you where you were last year or where you were six months ago. Did you grow? Did you not grow? Do you need to practice more so that you can grow faster for your needs? You know, you need to be looking within instead of looking at other people. Am I on the right path in working on my portfolio and then dropping my first collection, which will start growth of a company? I don't know why you would need a portfolio while you have, while you're starting a company because You need a portfolio if you're looking for a job at a different company, but you don't need a portfolio if you're starting your own company. You should just be focusing on starting your own company. Should I engage a seamstress to do samples to start or should I be looking into finding a factory? Well, I mean... It depends on your skill set and what you know how to do. If you know how to do everything except the sewing, then yeah, find a seamstress to do your sewing to make samples. But if you don't have any sort of garment construction skills, you should probably um, hire a factory that specializes who does the sampling process. Like they do the first patterns off of your flats and, you know, they do the first sampling and all that stuff. Some fact, you know, you have to be careful because some factories, they only do the production. Like I've worked with factories where you have to bring them a sew by sample and a sew by sample spelled S-E-W-B-Y, sew by sample. It means you sew the clothes exactly like the sample I'm giving you. And let's be real, a lot of seamstresses, they're not going to read your tech pack. They're not going to read through instructions. If they have a question on something, they just want to look at the sew by sample and copy it. And so your sew by sample should be exactly the way you want your garment done. And so all you do, some factories, they only do production. So they want you to come in with a cut ticket and a sew by sample. And that's all they're going to do. And so, and but some factories will do the sampling process with you. Though some, some of them will do all of it for you. Some of them will do only specific services. So you have to, when you're contacting factories, you need to talk about what services do you offer? Do you do sampling? Do you do part of the sampling? Do you do grading? Do you do production? What steps of the production do you do? All those things. 
time for style videos, Zoe. That's really not my area of expertise. Like I don't, I've never worked as a stylist or anything. So, I mean, do, 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 do. Can you show us your favorite collection that you've created? Nah. Ugh. I mean, I have so much work on Instagram. You know, y'all can, can look at that. <laughs> Need a practice, not magic. Zoe inspiration quote poster that I can print for my wall, please. You know, actually, people have contacted me saying they made their own. So maybe you just need to make your own. Uh, people will tag me on random Instagram posts where they like, you know, those posters where there's, they do that fancy script. I've seen some people who do that. Do you think it's necessary to go to university for fashion design in order to get a good job in the industry? To get a job in the industry, uh, it's not necessary, but it will make ev like getting a job in the industry super helpful. If you want to start your own business, it's not necessary, but to get a job working for someone else, like you will jump the queue to in the interviewing process if you do get a degree. Do you work for a company or are you, do you have my own line? I used to have my own line and I used to work for other companies and now I do the teaching thing full time. I used to teach at a university. I quit the university teaching in 2017 and I'm open to other university teaching gigs, but this sustains me for now. All portfolio questions should be directed to the school because they're the ones who are going to be reviewing it. They're going to be the ones that, that you have to please. So talk to the admissions department and ask them for specifics on your portfolio. Have you used Pina Tex, the pineapple leather substitute? I've heard of it, but I have not gotten my hands on any samples. I would like to at some point very soon. I also want to try that mushroom leather. The company making mushroom leather, they just got a huge investment bump. Like someone's investing like millions of dollars with them. So we should be seeing that mushroom leather more in the marketplace uh, eventually. And then there are those dudes making leather out of cactus, I think. Yes. And I only know about these. I read all these articles, but I've not seen any samples. So I would love to, though. Hi, I know nothing about your profession because I've done anesthesia for 40 years. Watching you, hearing you is like being invited to the moon. I love seeing your world. <laughs> I actually do get a lot of comments like that. Like people will say things like, uh, yeah, like a lot of people in the medical profession, doctors and nurses and some people in med school, they're like, we do this thing all day and then we come home and we just unwind listening to you talk about something completely unrelated to anything that we do. I'm like, cool. <laughs> Welcome. Mm. Zoe, how to improve my fashion sense. I don't really know what that means. Improve my fashion sense. I've been trying to do slopers for my dachshund. It's not easy since I don't know what I'm doing, but I watch your stuff to get an idea. You know what? Um, there are people who do make clothes for their dogs. Who's, who's did I see recently? You know, my friend Kathleen, Kathleen Fasanella. I follow her on Pinterest and she was pinning uh, patterns for dog clothes on her Pinterest board. So I know they exist. So try Pinterest. Bossman says, I have a brother machine and I'm starting to agree with you. Taha. <laughs> uh, just got a juke. Neat. Just got a jukey. HCL F600 for Christmas. Thanks, hubby. Oh, congratulations. That's a good husband. Do, do, do. 
I'm in high school, sophomore in high school, and learning how to sew and practicing my drawing and writing down ideas. Is that good? Yes. Any amount of practice is good. My schedule. Okay, so currently for 2020, my schedule is as follows. The first, everything is Tuesday. Okay, the first Tuesday of the month, I have a new video that is produced and edited and stuff in advance. My next video is the first Tuesday of April, and that is going to be a garment construction frequently asked questions and demo, like short answer demo video. Every month, the second Tuesday of every month, I produce an episode for my podcast on Patreon. And if you want access to that, um, let me just post the link in the chat, patreon.com slash Zoe Hong. And you need to join at the captive audience level to access that podcast. And that podcast has information that I keep on Patreon. I don't share that information. You can't find that information, like maybe like little bits and pieces, but like that content is only for my Patreon people. So, you know, that's the special thing they get for supporting me. And then every third Tuesday of the month, that's today, every third Tuesday of the month, I do a live stream. And usually there are 6 p.m. Pacific. I will change it. I, I have changed it up a little in the past to accommodate different time zones in the world. So, you know, you should keep your eye out on what time it is, but it will always be the third Tuesday. And they're usually only one hour, but today I'm going a little bit longer because I think we need a little bit more socialization with everyone being cooped up indoors lately. So I'm just kind of doing like a little COVID-19 special <laughs> and staying online a little bit longer. That's my schedule right now. Did you grow? I'll have this tattooed on my wrist. If you do, please send me a photo. I'd love to see it. <sighs> who decides trends? The forecasters or who or how they know what to wear in a year later, how they take decisions? Trends, it's... Generally, like those fashion forecasters, they don't really make stuff up. What they do is they watch runway shows, especially those of like the most, you know, luxury designer, trendy, like trend setting, forward thinking designers. And they analyze the shows and they spot the trends. They see the things that a lot of different designers are doing. And that's what I mean by sometimes you just design the same thing without even knowing it. You're not copying, but it just happens because, you know, you'll see it. Like you'll look at the runways and be like, cut, every designer is doing blue this season. And trend forecasters will pick up on that and say the new trend is blue. And then the people who like the trend is a curve. Okay. So the trend setters, you know, the trend forward people, they start at the beginning of the curve and they create the trends. And then the, the trend forecasters kind of disperse the trend knowledge to people. And then the trend, like the second tier, like contemporary, more mass market, they ride that trend. But the other, the designers who started that trend, they're moving on to the next trend. Okay. And then when you get to like bargain bin stuff, like Ross dress for less, the budget, the, the resale, they are like at the end of the trend, the end of the curve, bell curve. Okay. Hello to Detroit. Do, do, do. When you have your own line, how does someone find it? You find, you have to get PR and sales to kombucha leather. You have to get sales and PR to help you get the word out. Kombucha leather. That's so cool. McCall's has a dog pattern. <laughs> How can I have as a... As a high schooler, get involved in the fashion industry. My dream is to go to Parsons and work as a creative director. 
Um, you know, if you want to work, you can work in retail and you can like working retail for a more fashion forward company will help you understand shopping habits, which is really an important quality to have in a designer. And then also just practicing, um, your skills for design work. I have a video called how to prepare for fashion school. It's in my fashion school playlist and you can watch that for more information. Okay. I love Juki, but most of the kids that ask barely have enough money to buy a black Friday purchase of a brother or singer, but I would sell on anything that I don't have to fix. That's the thing is like, you don't have to fix a Juki. You can get a used one for a couple hundred bucks, but I understand what you're saying. Like, there are singers that um, are like not even a hundred dollars and you can buy them at target and stuff. And here's the thing. If you are one of those people who's trying to buy like a really, really super cheap uh, machine, like a singer um, in any kind of department store or whatever, I would buy the thing that has the fewest features, the fewest bells and whistles, the fewest things that have the possibility to break because if you have a straightforward machine that just does the stitching and you don't have to worry about like little digital programs or weird stitches and special stitches and stuff, then they're easiest to run, they're easiest to fix, and they're the most straightforward, they're the easiest to learn. And a lot of the time, all those fancy stitches, you don't need a lot of them, especially if you're trying to sew more, like leaning more industry practices. Okay. You know, I keep going back to the interview with Melissa because it's like fresh in my brain. But yeah, like we were talking about how she used to write directions for home sewing, um, home sewing patterns. And someone was like, you've never seen a pattern before. And I'm like, no, I've never seen a home sewing pattern before. It's really different. And we were talking about how industry patterns and home sewing patterns look different. And industry sewing practices and home sewing techniques are different because we have different needs and we have different workarounds and so yeah, the processes are going to be different. But if you're trying to learn, eventually learn industry sewing processes, you don't need a lot of fancy stitches. You need a machine that does a nice, solid, straight stitch and doesn't break on you. So get the get the one with the that looks solid and has the fewest bells and whistles to make your life a nightmare. So we do like draping. I feel like I'm trapped in the frame of how it should be like. I like draping, but I don't love draping. And it can, it can be useful for specific things. Um, like if you saw, like a couple of weeks ago, I posted a picture of a black leather ball gown, like with, with a corset bodice and that I made many years ago. And I draped, I did a muslin drape of the bodice because the seams were not your standard, you know, princess seams. Like the this, this seams like wrapped and twisted all around the bodice. And there is a picture of that. And so, you know, it was really way easier to drape that on the form and to kind of visualize the 3D of how I wanted to swirl and wrap around because I didn't have standard side seams either. But it, draping is not necessary for every single thing. Okay, Pattern making is necessary for every single thing. Even if you drape, you have to eventually make a pattern for it if you're going to mass produce it. And by mass produce, I mean make two or more. So... Should I double major in fashion merchandise and business? Uh, well, you know, fashion merchandising is kind of the most businessy of all the fashion majors. So, what is the reference for did you grow? Oh, I was talking about um, instead of comparing yourself to others to look back at your work from a year ago, from six uh, months ago, et cetera, and ask yourself, did you grow? Do, do, do. I meant how can I find your line of clothes? I closed my business years ago. It's not anywhere now. Do, do, do. Sustainable 
fabric companies. Hmm. I don't know if like, I mean, there are a lot of companies where they have sustainable products and, uh, Within there, like they'll do like a lot of cottons and then they'll have like a line of organic cottons. Um, why am I brain farting? I've been on this chat too long. <laughs> but yeah, there's a. There's a lot of people out there. Um, oh, Lensig. Is that the one? Hold on. Yeah, lensing. Let me just write that in the chat real quick. Lensing. Lensing is like a major one. They do linens and tensiles and stuff, and they have these proprietary methods for uh, producing these fabrics. That's a big one. But, you know, just do a quick Google search. And also, when you're Googling around for sustainable fabrics, what you need to do is look up their certifications. You know, it's not enough for people to just say, oh, this is organic. Like, I, you need to have some kind of certification that says, you know, this... Um, this product is organic, this, this product is recycled, et cetera, et cetera. And you can also Google those sustainable fabric um, certifications. What's the difference between industrial sewing machines and the ones with plastic covers like Brother and Juki? Okay, so Brother and Juki, they're brands and they make all kinds of sewing machines. So that's outside the equation. Industrial sewing machines, that, that one is my overlock and is also an industrial. So you should watch my intro to industrial sewing machines video and my intro to overlock machines. But basically industrial sewing machines, they come with this table and the this is the motor for the, the machine underneath here. And under here are the pedals to work the machine. Okay. And then my single needles over there and the, it's the same underneath it. So it's the whole kit and caboodle. It's solid as a rock. It's a, it's created for people who sew on these eight hours a day, just cranking out production. Okay. That's what they're made for. They were, they're made for durability and, uh, home sewing machines. They're just not as durable and, you know, they, you know, some of them can be fancy and do like little decorative stitchings and embroideries and things like that. But for the most part, these machines, they'll sew through thicker fabrics, you know, many layers of denim, many layers of leather, um, you know, cotton duck, Duchess satin, all the, well, Duchess satin, never mind on that. But home sewing machines, they are a little bit more finicky. They are a little bit more delicate. You can't, I mean, you can sew on them for a long time, but they're not really built for that. They're not built for, you know, set five days a week, eight hours a day. And I don't really know how thick of a fabric and how many layers of, of thick fabric you can get on those machines before they start getting really cranky on you. You know, they're just, industrials are much more stable. Like, uh, I don't have to fix the tension on my machine so much because it's just more durable. What do you think about Anna Wintour? Do you think she's cold and have you ever met her? I have never met Anna Wintour. And, you know, I believe she is like every celebrity in the world where they have an outer persona and they have their own personality. And not to say that celebrities are fake, um, but there's an image that they put out to the world that also helps shield them, but also helps them in their career. And so maybe she's even meaner than we know. Maybe she's nicer than we think. I want to have my own company. So does that mean fashion merchandising is okay? Yes.
I mean, you would need to hire some fashion designers who really understood construction because most merchandising programs don't study construction. They study some design, but they don't study any construction. I'm a seamstress just dying for more creative professional opportunity. Any suggestions for what my move should be? Hmm. You know, actually, because Shirley's in this chat, that reminds me of our interview where she was talking about how costume houses, costume shops are always looking for more help in the costume shop building costumes. And honestly, there are like, you know, theaters everywhere, you know, no matter where you live, you know, small towns have their own you know, little theater where they do local productions, or you could be in a big city with like a big theater, several big theaters, and they need help in their costume shop. And so, you know, that could be a way to get in, like go at, to your local costume shop and see if they're hiring people to help build costumes. Because that's one of the things Shirley said in her interview about how to get a step into the costume industry is to go to a shop, start building, get to know people. Um, if you can hook up with, say, um, a designer who's looking for a sample maker, or if you're looking to design yourself, maybe you can get into custom dress making. Don't industrials only do one stitch usually? Yes. And in, like, because we don't really use kind of like decorative stitching. We don't use zigzags. It's, we do the straight stitch for like practically everything other than like overlock and cover stitch. So, you know, in the industry, we have specific machines to do these specific things. So we don't have to fuss around with setting, changing settings. We make like, the industry uses these really durable machines that constantly do this one thing and this one thing perfectly. And all so many of our stitching techniques, if you watch my How to Sew Eight Common Seams video, they're all done just on the single needle. And that's just how the industry works is so much of it is done on the single needle. And then of course, there's a lot of overlocking done, especially for knits and seam finishing on cheaper garments. And then there's cover stitch and then button holders. Like there's not a lot of like, fancy stitching going on. It's about the processes to make a nice seam, if that makes sense, the difference between the two. Thanks, So I hope you don't mind going to use the did you grow line. I'm a therapist and that is a great therapeutic question. Yes, please use it. It's something I use with my students all the time. Did you grow? And yeah, I'm flattered. <sighs> I really love, okay. So we're at eight. I think I'm going to go for about like five, 10 more minutes. Okay. So let's wrap up with the questions. I really love fashion. Don't know what I would do without fashion art. I'm a senior in high school, have a strict family that wants me to get into medical or criminal justice. I'm doubting myself if I got into fashion, would I regret it? I mean... There's really no way I can answer that for you. You have to answer that for yourself. And I have a video called uh, Is Fashion Worth It? that you can watch where I present a lot of scenarios and questions that you can ask yourself uh, on the path to making that decision. But you really need to make that decision for yourself. Two layers of wool felt and my machine starts making awful noises. Anything with high thread count, four layers or more, all my beginning sewer singers sound awful. Yeah. Mm. Agreed. Industry pattern are more a little more complex for someone self-study like me. I just started disassembling my own clothes and would often go window shopping just to check out how some garments are made. That is exactly what you should be doing. That is the best way to study garment construction. If you don't have a teacher like sitting there, like literally like helping you figure out patterns is like, yeah, you just need to look at your own clothes. Did you catch that tidbit uh, about v &A and Claire McArdle? So as you know, I'm doing a future video on a Claire McArdle deep 
Dive, the uh, who I believe is the underrated fashion designer of the 20th century. And she was, you know, uh, I was reading up about her and she had gone to Paris and she would go to Madeleine Viennet's sample sales and she would buy her samples and take them home and take them apart to learn how she made these clothes and then sew her own versions. And it's like, that's what you do. You take apart clothes. If you can't figure it out, turn them inside out, take them apart, take the lining out, see how it's sewn on the inside. Go look at garments in stores. Go window shopping. Yep. <sighs> Do you have experience with screen printing or embroidery? Yes. Do you have a different question? Zoe, will you continue the Fashion History Series? Yes, eventually. I think it's going to be the Garment Construction FAQ video, and then May will be Claire McCardle, and then June will be the 1930s. Have you watched the Andrew Leon Talley documentary? No, I did not know he had one. It's so tempting to pull all-nighters and sew as much as possible, especially lately. Sewing while tired is probably a good idea. Any tips? <laughs> Listen, okay. I, I remember the story from college so vividly because it was just one of those like, oh, man, we all got to go home now moments. <laughs> so when I was in school, and it's probably different now at, the, at Otis. So I went to Otis College of Art and Design down in L.A., and – at the time, uh, like all the underclassmen, everyone had to go home by 11 p.m. except seniors. Seniors were discouraged but allowed to stay overnight in the sewing studio. So all the other classrooms were locked up, but we had two big studio rooms that had the same key and all the seniors were given a key. So we were technically allowed to stay, but not encouraged to stay. Did I ever bump into any teachers or my department chair while brushing my teeth in the morning in the bathroom? Maybe. Uh, one day we were, there was like maybe six or seven of us in sewing studio, like two, three in the morning. We had a deadline, obvi. We had the radio playing, just like um, real dancey music to keep us awake. And I was doing my thing and I heard some like commotion behind me and I turned around and my girlfriend, Jen, if you remember my girlfriend, Jen in the Taylor and Sage video, the, uh, the head designer over there, <laughs> she had like long fingernails and she, you know, she was running the machine with her fingers like this. Right. And one of her fingernails were long, was long enough that she had sewn over the nail and she didn't hit flesh just the nail and she had picked up and like there were thread loops <laughs> coming through the nail and she's like I think it's time to go home <laughs> so yeah, don't don't sew while you're sleepy stay awake play some I mean maybe have your headphones on but play some music to stay awake but the second you're like losing your concentration you should not be doing anything with like heavy scissors seam rippers, uh, needles going 100 miles an hour. Yeah, not, do not do those things. Uh, who do you think are trendsetters in the fashion world? Mm, well, I think there are a lot of them, but we are living in this wonderful age where we have like a million different lifestyles and kind of trend groups. It used to be, you know, for many years, it was like, this was the style for rich people. This is what rich people wore. And then poor people wore like a poor version of the same, you know, corseted bodices, big poofy skirts in a specific shape, you know, high necklines, low necklines, whatever. Right. But now we're just so like, we get to, we get to do whatever we want. You know, there's so much choice available. I don't know. We could talk about this for like a hundred years.
Any good templates for contracts that keep warehouses from stealing your designs, ideas when you use them for a production? No. It's just, they'll, they'll change 10% and tell you that it's their design or they saw it somewhere else or we talked about this. I can knit and crochet very well and have some great ideas. How do you feel about knit fashion? Knit fashion. So listen, crocheting cannot be done by machine. And so there's not much of a future in crochet in terms of, you know, mass market, major production, anything like that. So that would only have to be like on a local kind of like homemade sort of thing. But knit. So knits are in two categories, cut and sew knits and fully fashioned knits. And so cut and sew knits are basically the same as any other kind of knit, like a fabric where you make a pattern, you cut it out out of yardage, and then you sew it together. But fully fashioned knit, the kind you do by hand, I mean, you could do this kind of by machine too, but the kind you do by hand, you, you, are, you take a skein of yarn and you are plotting stitch by stitch by stitch. And therefore, and then you just, knit the whole garment off the yarn and you don't have any waste. I mean, you have leftover yarn, which is totally usable for the next garment, but you don't have any fabric waste because you didn't cut anything away. And so fully fashioned knits done on machines is far more sustainable than cut and sew knits, than wovens. And it's something that I think is a major player in the future of fashion. And there are so many cool things you could do with knits. I wish I knew more about knits, but I just started uh, a Knitspiration Pinterest board. It's a, is it a secret board right now? I forget. Cause I usually like build up a board before I, uh, before I start sharing it. But yeah, knits, if you are, if you know how to knit, and you can start learning how to knit on machines, like fully fashioned knit machines, and you can go and do it. My, so most of you know already, I have a book recommendation list on my Amazon shop, amazon.com slash shop.zoehong. Let me just write that in the chat. Do, 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 do. And I don't know if that book is there because I don't know if it's available on Amazon, but there is a book called Knitwear by Carol Brown, and it's bomb. And you should totally read that book. Mm. Mm, thanks. Oh my God, the needle punched through his hand. <sighs> I just had sympathy pain spasms through my hand. Woo. One of my classmates sewed her finger in home ec in junior high. They took apart the whole machine so they could leave the needle in her finger. Yeah, I never had any things like that happen. But yeah, so like after Jen like sewed through her fingernail, we're all like, yeah, let's all go home. That's so great. Great idea, everyone. All right. And we all left. Whew. Okay, that is it for questions. I actually ran out of questions. Two hours, eight minutes, and 50 seconds. I've run out of questions for the evening. <laughs> all right, I'm going to close out today. I hope you all had fun hanging out. I hope you made some friends. Everyone go join the Facebook group to keep making friends and to continue your friendships and share work and share ideas. And yeah, go ahead and post. And, you know, again, like I said, if you're up to sharing work, but you're not, a, you know, you're not feeling brave enough to accept stranger critique, you just go ahead and post that on your post. Like I'm not ready for critique, but I wanted to share. And whoever has some experience with second life, I'd love to see a conversation start about that. And, uh, for those of you who are bored at home, uh, we started a thread on, uh, different podcasts that are cool to listen to in that group as well to keep your brains occupied. 
all that kind of thing. And I hope you enjoyed this chat. Please give it a thumbs up if you did and share, of course, with other people. I mean, this can be a podcast on its own to listen to in the background uh, while you do things. So there's that. Thank you everyone for hanging out. This was super fun for me too, because you know, I live in a place that's uh, under lockdown and I can't leave either. So this was super, super fun. And I will see you all my next video and my top next podcast, you know, all the good things. Bye.